speaker, Presenter Fernando, from Queen Mary West Hill College of London, who will tell us how to design a Darwinian brain. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work that Ursh and I have been doing um, for the last few years. Uh, and it's been to test a rather strange hypothesis that some kind of evolution goes on in your brain. So we basically propose that there are replicators in your brain. So this is very speculative, of course. It's a hypothesis, and it's, we're doing exploration in this. We propose that there are replicators in your brain and that they evolve by natural selection as you think and sleep, um, and that they allow open-ended thought by the generation and selection of units in your brain. And why do we have this crazy idea? Well, we suspect it's true because of a convergence of uh, implementation and algorithmic arguments, and we're testing this hypothesis now in three domains of abstraction. At the neuronal level, so we're actually looking to see whether th things could replicate in your brain, whether there could be units of evolution, at the cognitive level to try and fit human behavior to um, evolutionary uh, models, and at the constructive level to see if we can make robots that um, uh, use evolution in their um, uh, controllers in order to produce um, open-ended behavior in some sense. So um, Ursh is too polite to say this, but frankly, we were annoyed by Gerald Edelman. Um, because Gerald Edelman has a theory called uh, neural Darwinism, which is not Darwinian at all. Um, in fact, he's probably held the theory of neural Darwinism back by some decades. Um, so we, after a careful reading of Edelman, there's no replicators, no units of evolution, no things that multiply with variation and heredity in his theory. And so we thought it worthwhile to ask whether there could be actual units of evolution in the brain. Why? Because. Natural selection is an algorithm that's capable of the accumulation of adaptation. Making a copy um, is actually useful in search because the principle of duplication and divergence means you don't lose the original. So when you change something, you can always go back. Um, and so I summarize it like this, uh, the idea of the evolution of probability like this, that the watchmaker is blind, but he's not stupid. So uh, what I mean by that is that uh, I'm one of the people that believes that evolution gets better over time, that it's able to improve its uh, quality of search. Now, I know that evolution doesn't look ahead, um, but neither do great chess players. So Reti was asked, how many moves do you look ahead? He said, one, the right one. So <laughs> he does that by perceptual chunking, right? He doesn't, um, and then he spends 15, 20 minutes just checking that his actual move is correct. So that's the kind of insight that I think uh, evolution has, because it has an experience of, even though it's blind, it has experience. So, um, that, so, the, so the, there's a fine, I think there's a gradient between sophisticated inductive cognition and blind um, random uh, exploration. Also, um, in terms of cognitive architectures, we need to have something that can accumulate adaptation, be able to solve many tasks, use what it's learned in the past to solve new tasks. In machine learning, we don't have that, frankly. There's no machine learning algorithm that can uh, you, you would wish to leave on for 10 years and it would continue to get better over time. So uh, these are the, some of the, the reasons. We're actually exploring this now in a project um, with Kevin Starris in Sussex who's actually got fetal rat neuron cultures and we're trying to basically do seeding experiments in that to see what, what can be copied. So let's um, just examine what natural selection is first. So um, John Maynard Smith defines natural selection as a an algorithm, I think it's actually a class of algorithms that takes place when you have the uh, following uh, properties. You have units of evolution. These are things which multiply. Um, there's variation, which means that A is different from B. And uh, there's heredity, so the offspring of A resemble A more than they resemble B. So this is a, um, a class of algorithms in the sense that it can be implemented in many substrates. So just as it's implemented in the immune system to some extent, um, we're wondering, can it be implemented in the brain? So I just want to um, examine carefully a, a, uh, two different definitions of uh, natural selection, which have possibly explain why Edelman has called his theory neural Darwinism. So Price um, defines a process um, uh, which uh, Edelman may have equated with natural selection, which is one where if there's a covariance between a trait and the probability of its transmission, then um, uh, you'll have uh, that trait increasing in, in, in frequency in the population. 
Um, but this applies to many things. Uh, in, in fact, Price in his paper says it even applies to the tuning of radios. Um, so that's not, oops, that's not uh, what, I, what John Maynard Smith means by natural selection. So let me give you an example. So we've got a classification here, which I want to explore. So consider st solitary search, stochastic hill climbing. You've got one robot or one, one agent on a, on a hillside, and it basically does stochastic hill climbing. I call that solitary search, OK? So a stupid, fairly stupid thing to do would be to do parallel independent solitary search, and that would give you some speed up. So these robots don't communicate with each other. There's no transmission of information. And they'll have a slightly higher probability of getting to a, a, a global optimum. So that's parallel independent solitary search. Next, we can have um, uh, competitive learning. Competitive learning is where you have multiple search points, but you give more exploration resources to the search points that are currently higher up. So the equations, the, this multiplicative um, stuff that we were talking about earlier is, falls into that. That's a selectionist algorithm. That's not natural selection. Natural selection happens when you have many search points, but there's actually recruitment so that things that are currently higher up uh, reconfigure matter in other places in order to be more like itself. There's actually information transmission. What's transmitted here is the, ex, uh, is the position of the uh, robot, of the solution in space. So there's actually information transfer in space. So uh, that's actually um, what we consider to be um, the subset of algorithms which are natural selection according to John Maynard Smith. And formally, um, particle filters, uh, <coughs> particle swarm optimization, uh, the immune system, genetic natural selection, and uh, genetic algorithms fall into this class. So it's a class where there is actually information transfer in space. And that's a su only a subset of the things that Price is talking about. And it's uh, the subset of things we're exploring in, in the brain. Okay. Another reason we find this important to look at is that there's a, 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 a deep relationship between Bayesian inference and natural selection. So here's Bayes' equation, and there's the replicator equation. So we see um, that the, the uh, frequency of something in the population, the relative frequency of something in the population, can be thought of as the probability of that hypothesis in, uh, in generation t. In generation t plus 1, the posterior can be thought of as the frequency of the, that um, uh, variant in the population. And the likelihood uh, can be thought of as its uh, fitness. So. Um, this is interesting because in cognitive science, a Bayesian uh, uh, framework for induction is becoming very popular. And we basically propose that natural selection is an efficient way of implementing approximate Bayesian inference uh, in the brain. So, OK, so this is all very, this is the, our kind of motivation why we think we're not completely mad. Um, so, this leaves, so what, what, what the hell can replicate in your brain? So we're trying to work out um, models that are plausible. So we want to work out, we don't know, is the answer. And so what we're do doing is trying to come up with various things that could replicate in your brain. And so here's our first attempt. So the idea is that here is that a pattern of connectivity could replicate in your brain. So here, neuron B is connected to neuron C, and neuron B is connected to neuron A, right? So that's a pattern of connectivity. And the idea is that if a topographic map can be achieved, uh, then some kind of inference process in another region of the brain can observe the spikes happening in this part of the brain and reconstruct that pattern of connectivity. OK? That's the uh, first idea. So we wrote a model about that in um, uh, 2008. And <coughs> sorry? Yeah. Um, with population codes and things like that. Do you guys know about that? Yeah. Work with that? Yeah. So basically, physicists have rediscovered natural selection in that literature. So, what happened, so basically, population MCMC uh, particle filters, these are formally equivalent to the algorithm that John Maynard Smith is talking about. So that, that we actually found that extremely interesting. Um, the, the problems that they face are still the problems that uh, evolutionary computation faces how to do a, how to make a good proposal distribution in order to be able to 
they also want to sample a distribution, but we want to maximize something. So there's, so there's slightly different motivations in, in the two fields, but they are very deeply related. So um, just to go into this in a bit more detail, we got a paper that uh, came out recently that actually I think makes a much nicer model about, about this. And it's quite, what I like about it is that the copying that we propose of patterns of connectivity in the brain actually occurs by causal inference. This part of brain observes the pattern of spontaneous activity in this part of brain and infers the connectivity pattern that would have caused it. And that's nice because that same mechanism can explain how that part of the brain does causal inference about the world, events in the world. So one of the things we've done is to explain the experiments of Alison Gopnik um, with Blickets on causal inference in children. Now I assume that people here don't really care much about causal inference in children, so I'm not going to talk about it in a great deal of detail unless people want me to afterwards. But I'll just go into the, uh, how this copying works briefly. So the idea is that, um, has anybody, who's heard of spike time dependent plasticity? Hands up. Okay, so spike time dependent plasticity is an asymmetric Hebbian learning rule, which um, works like this. If a presynaptic neuron fires before a postsynaptic one, then the weight of that connection goes up. But if the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic one, then the weight of the connection actually goes down, right? So it's inferring a very simple kind of um, causality. It might be not causality because something else might have caused both these things to fire at different times, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, an, it's a guess uh, based on a heuristic of temporal differences. Um, so what we've got is a mechanism that has three plasticity rules which can infer these kinds of causal networks. Um, and the three plasticity rules are spike time dependent plasticity, and very interestingly, it's multiplicative. So that multiplicative nature is exactly the same as the multiplicative nature we were looking at earlier. There's a couple of rules that say if there's a postsynaptic spike and no presynaptic spike, then you reduce the, the weight. And if there's a presynaptic spike and no postsynaptic spike, you reduce the weight as well. And that implements, the, um, and then there's something that implements the Rascola Wagner um, rule, which is implemented in heterosynaptic competition. And, Basically, what this means is that it, it explains a couple of things in causal inference called uh, backwards blocking and um, uh, uh, screening off. So I don't want to go into the details of that, but basically, if you implement these plasticity rules, then we've shown that... I'll skip this bit. If we implement these plasticity rules, we've shown that we can copy various structures of... Uh, well, all the possible structures, actually, of, uh, uh, of a three-node system, and this can trivially generalize to a, a larger system if you allow... Um, activity not to spread. So we can infer the temporal and, and we can infer the delays between these things as well. So this is one method by which a certain suprasynaptic organization, a unit of information in the brain that's more than just one synapse, could be um, uh, copied from one part of the brain to another. Uh, this is actually what we're trying to test with Kevin's uh, fetal rat neuron. So you take the, you take the pregnant rat, um, kill it, um, take its fetus's brains out and solubilize them and put them in a uh, on a microelectrode array, and then you stimulate them with a pattern of activity that would have been produced by one um, causal network, and then you observe the spontaneous activity and see if it's able to entrain that spontaneous activity, and then see if you can copy that into another dish. Um, we've just about got the, uh, the fetal rat neurons working in the dish, and we can stimulate them now, so I can't, we don't know. It's obviously not going to work. So what we need to do is to basically um, iterate. We, I mean, we, we, we spent two years getting the, 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 the grant to do that, and now we can actually, in our experiments, refine our models and do more experiments. So that's one um, approach. OK, so that's one thing that could replicate. Yep? Could you just go back and explain what got copied to what? Ah, sorry, yes. Because um, I don't see any patterns that look like this. OK. Right, so this is a, this is a um, weight matrix of from and to. And this is the, the pattern that we're, this is the network that we're trying to copy. And so these, um, these black dots indicate where the weights are high. So what's being copied is, uh, so we've got a, basically a, a network here. And OK, what happens is this. We have a weakly connected network at the top, fully connected weak. And we randomly stimulate with uh, sparse activation this network. So what happens is if you stimulate this neuron here, very shortly afterwards there'll be a spike here and a spike there, right? So these neurons will spike slightly after that one. So according to spike time-dependent plasticity, what will happen is that 
the, the strength of that connection, the strength of that connection will increase a bit. But, but there'll be a false, if there's a, different, if there's a different delay here, there'll be a false positive inference of a connection like that or that, depending on how you, the delays are sorted out. So the extra rules that we've got are designed to uh, basically uh, deal with these false positive and negative inferences that happen. So it's basically, this, this network has this plasticity rule, set of plasticity rules, is observing the spikes from this one, and is reconstructing these uh, patterns of connectivity that, uh, but not exactly there are some errors. So if it's stochastic, then there's always going to be some errors in the, in the copying here. So that's, but that's what... The, the, this network is also influencing itself? Yes. So that's, that, that, yeah. But we have the rule that typically what happens is, um, for this to fire, you need both activity from here and from there for that to fire. So that's, there are some um, uh, details like that that are required for, the, for this copying to work. But that's the idea, that you can copy patterns of connectivity from one part of the brain to another. OK, so that's something that could happen in the order of um, minutes. Um, so that's quite slow, in a way. So here's another idea. Uh, this is a bit weird. This is the idea is that um, you can actually have, oops. The idea is that you could actually have units of evolution embedded in a, in a network. So here we have a network. And there's two possible flows through this network, like that or like that. So these are paths. And in this network, there are, there are more possible paths. So in this network, there's a, there's a path, there's a path, there's a path, and there's a path. Four possible paths through this network. And each of those paths has a certain probability of being taken. And in a, we've been able to show that this is actually, uh, so here's an example. So here's activity that goes down one path. Um, and this is actually formally equivalent to a unit of evolution. So a mutation is a, a bypass, an alternative route through that uh, path, through that network. And if that is fitter, then that will survive, and the original uh, will be destroyed. So this is actually um, uh, formally equivalent to a lo two locus, two allo model. That's what I've described there. So the frequency we've got, uh, so you take a path. That path has a certain produces a certain reward, and that reward reinforces that path in proportion to its, the reward. And paths which have more reward have a higher probability of producing mutations. So uh, it turns out, then, that uh, we're basically implementing a genetic algorithm in a, in a network. But what's interesting about this system is the paths actually overlap. So when you change one path, you're influencing the genotypes of all the, the, uh, the other parts that share that. Uh, component of the part. So it's interestingly different also from um, a genetic algorithm. Does it satisfy John Maynard Spitz's notion of ev units of evolution? Well, if you uh, produce an offspring and it's exactly identical to you, then there's no explicit multiplication. It's just strengthening. But if your offspring is different, then there is a new part. And uh, the different, only the difference between you and your offspring is represented by the bypass. Uh, so what, what it means is that you actually are maintaining a population of solutions in this network, but you're only evaluating one solution at a time. So it's a sort of kind of halfway house between um, uh, proper natural selection, where you can have simultaneous evaluation of all the, the population at the same time, but you do actually maintain many um, solutions. So we've tried this out on a range of combinatorial optimization problems. One of the, um, in some cases it does better, in some cases it does worse than a standard GA. Some, Nice properties are, for example, that if you have many different environments, so here's two environments, just we want it to, the all ones and the all zeros problem, um, and we're flipping that environment at regular intervals. That's the GA in, in, um, uh, in red, and our system over, over a while can actually adapt faster to the, the problem because that solution, the, the old path, still remains in the network. So here's the, here's the part for the all zeros and the all ones. So um, we've also tried on things like the uh, Richards Hiff problem, and it's able to do quite well in that. So, I'm, so here's one kind of implementation of uh, natural selection in a rather weird way, where you've got genotypes overlapping. Organisms don't overlap with each other typically, um, but here we, our, our units of evolution can. So, so what's the Hiff? Oh, right, right. Well, Richard will, you should all come to Richard's talk on Friday. Don't go home. Um, he's going to talk about the HIF in detail, but it's basically a problem uh, that he invented, um, which is a, uh, uh, a problem which produces a really pathological fitness landscape with lots of local optimism. You've basically got to 
um, the, the two best solutions are either all ones or all zeros. And it's a hierarchical problem, so it has structure. You've got, you basically look at pairs of uh, adjacent uh, loci. If they're both one or both zero, then that produces a one at the next level. But if they're uh, uh, zero and one, then that produces a zero at the next level. And then you keep doing that, and you scale it uh, for different levels. So it's a, it's a, he made it up. Um, and didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. So right. It stands for he invented four private. Uh, it stands for hierarchical if and only if. You can think of it as a hierarchical parity function or a hierarchical XOR as well. Okay, yeah. So, what we've, so, okay, so the, I've been talking about two kinds of copying the copying of patterns of connectivity and the copying of parts of activation through a structure which is formally equivalent to a population. Um, another thing you can do is to um, think about patterns of bistable neural activation as being copied. So if you have a, uh, a set of neurons, then they can be bistably on or off, and you can copy that. You can basically implement something like a one plus one evolution strategy, so that you copy this to another set of neurons uh, with, with some mutation. And you do that for a while, and then what uh, Richard discovered is that if you have a bit of heavy and learning, and he'll probably talk about this, if you have a bit of heavy and learning going on, then what happens is actually you learn um, uh, off diagonal weights. And that means that when you uh, do copying again, you actually are learning basically linkage between these um, alleles. So that your copying becomes uh, non-random. And, and so we were very happy with that because it means that um, potentially natural selection in the brain could be more powerful than genetic natural selection because there are uh, all kinds of learning algorithms that can be used to structure your exploration distribution in ways that genetics would find hard. Now that principle is something that um, we've been extending recently. Uh, so here, uh, we're learning basically a covariance matrix. And it turns out that you can actually learn much more complicated and interesting uh, models about uh, the kinds of the structure of the fitness landscape. So what we, what we do in this, this is also the here, 128 bit. What we do here is to train something called a denoising autoencoder, which is a neural network on the best bit of the population, the best sample of the population so far. And we train it so that it takes one of those um, individuals, the genotypes, applies some noise to it, and tries to reconstruct the original. So it basically trains it uh, to find uh, the best part of the population from a larger basin of attraction. And uh, we're using single-layered denoising autoencoders, but the potential is we can use uh, deeper uh, System. So by combining supervised learning in order to try and learn the structure of the space with uh, stochastic uh, optimization, we hope to be able to improve um, on, on those algorithms. And I think we're going to be discovering soon that uh, trying to discover how evolution can learn structure is an important principle. <coughs> is an important principle. So let me just play the <coughs> little video. So this is uh, the system evolving to uh, basically discover the, uh, the HIF problem. So, okay. Okay, so this is all quite abstract at the moment. So I've proposed three different kinds of things that could replicate in the brain. Um, patterns of connectivity, patterns of activity, and pathways. Probably um, uh, there are others. So what's the evidence for any kind of replication in the brain? Well, um, replication is different from copying, right? There's lots of copying in my computer, but there's no replication, yeah? Uh, because to have replication, you have to copy the probability of being transmitted as well. So I can give an example of copying in the brain, uh, at least. And that is, uh, if you take a, uh, a cat and cut a part of its retina out, and you um, look at the cells in its in visual, primary visual cortex, then that area of cortex that is, not, that is no longer uh, receiving inputs, those cells won't fire anymore, and they'll become very sensitive. And if you have spike time dependent plasticity, this is described in this paper. If you have spike time dependent plasticity, what will happen is one of those, the orientation selectivity of those cells will copy the orientation selectivity of one of the adjacent cells in, um, in V1. And um, so that's uh, nice. It doesn't actually completely confirm uh, replication, because to show replication, you'd have to show that when uh, this copies from that, then the probability of that being copied somewhere else is, is uh, proportional to that. Um, is somehow co-varying with that trait, right? So we have to, we're not sure whether that's uh, an example, but 
Recently, there's a paper by Kilgard about cortical map plasticity, where he actually says that the way that um, uh, neural regions, like, for example, in taxi drivers, uh, the bit of the brain that's uh, responsible for uh, representing uh, uh, streets in London grows, and in, and, and in birds in spring, the bit of the brain that's responsible for um, singing enlarges. So there's, there's, the, there's the growth and shrinkage of uh, these cortical areas. And, and so the question is, and then what happens is, this is doing some kind of search, and then there's a, a recontraction of the, of the representation. You don't have to have this larger area. The larger area is large because it's increasing its effective population size. And then it shrinks again, and the right solution is, is there. So that principle of cortical map plasticity, there's loads of beautiful data in the auditory cortex. Uh, Kilgard works in the auditory cortex, which we're trying now to model. So we, we need to have more realistic models of uh, the, the cortex and how um, copying could be implemented in that through spike time dependent plasticity. But this gives us a sort of data we can look at. Um, right. So that's the first part about implementations. The second part is to try and actually get um, to see, OK, so I've described how there might be replicators in the brain. You know, it's worth uh, looking at. And so the question now is, what kind of algorithmic advantages could replicators in your brain give you that we don't um, have the capacity to explain already. So a lot of this data is, I think, going to come from child development. How uh, children are able to um, uh, accumulate adaptations over time during um, infancy. So one of the things we've been looking at is, can we, uh, so we had, a, so this is a hard problem. <laughs> now, it, it, not only are we trying to find replicators in the brain, which we haven't found, we are also trying to explain how these replicators could produce functions. So we want to explain the, we want to do, um, we want to discover the, the hereditary substrate and discover the whole principles of the development in one go. So that's obviously quite hard. Um, so one of the principles that we have is that natural selection is able to do search, it's sparse search over symbolic spaces. Uh, so in cognitive <coughs> science, there's a, a bit of a a fight between the symbol systems people and the connectionists, right? Uh, the symbol systems people like Gary Marcus and um, Fodor and uh, others, they say that cognition uh, requires compositionality and systematicity, which basically means that um, there's something like molecules in there, things that um, can uh, uh, make connections with each other in lawful ways in, in which the structure determines the function, but just like uh, in a molecule. The, the, its function will be a... a, a a lawful configuration uh, function of its, uh, the, the atoms and the way the atoms are connected. So that's really required for open-endedness, but nobody knows how to implement that in um, uh, neural networks. So we've got some ideas about that, but this level of description here is a computational level of description. So as well as doing neuronal models, we're trying to do computational models, which include uh, natural selection. So these kinds of controllers that we're evolving, so this is like a bag, this whole thing is the unit of evolution. And we're evolving, basically, um, pack graphs. So it's a bit like um, genetic programming, but it's not, because all these units are, could be neural networks. So this could be a Zikovic uh, thing. This could be a CTRNN. This could be any learning, any, basically any chapter in a machine learning textbook, again, that could be implemented in one of these. And these things are how the messages are passed between um, uh, uh, units. So we were doing direct policy search. So that's typically what people do in evolutionary computation, which is just um, you, you evolve stuff, and there's a, the sensory input going in that controls the motors going out. So that's one of the things we try to do. And one of the other motivations uh, of the next the experiment I'm going to show you is that we didn't want to put in an explicit fitness function. We didn't want to say, um, because when you have a child, the child um, does, does something called play. The child doesn't get any explicit reward from that. The child has um, intrinsic motivation. So there's some kind of low-dimensional, uh, task-independent uh, fitness function that the child has to determine its behavior that's not dependent on external reward. And there's a whole field of people looking at this intrinsic motivation. So what is the child trying to maximize when he puts it in a jolly jumper? Um, Esther Thielen says it's bounce per ounce. So what does that mean? So there's, people are saying that, for example, children might want to maximize the first derivative of predictability. You don't want to maximize predictability, otherwise this is very predictable. Look. So 
you want to, but you want to maximize the first derivative of predictability. You want predictability to keep increasing. Schmidt Huber says you want to maximize uh, the first derivative of compressibility. He says that uh, beauty is um, compressibility and interestingness is the first derivative of compressibility. Um, there's a whole quasi species of ideas about what you want to maximize that is coming up in the literature. Nobody knows exactly what the third dimensional set of values is that we want to maximize, but um, undoubtedly it must exist. So uh, another thing is you might want to maximize um, variance in the population because under some ridiculous assumptions that might uh, increase the rate of fitness increase. So there are lots of uh, things that you might want to maximize in order to improve the quality of search. And the brain, because it's been evolved um, as a unit, can uh, develop ways of actually improving itself as an evolutionary system. So the problem here is... There has to be something which is trying to maximize rather than just some dynamics. Yes. Not looking as if it's trying to maximize something. Uh, well, I think that, the, I think that we have, we're, we're, well, it doesn't have to be, of course, but I think that uh, we are entities which have values, and values are the things that we try to maximize, and each of us is different in that we have a very unique set of values. I mean, no, no two people's values are exactly the same. There's a combinatorial explosion of possible values, and that's largely what determines um, our uniqueness. That's why it's sad when someone dies, because you can't really reconstruct that very unique subset of values that they had. It doesn't really matter whether they forget most of the things. What makes them them is their unique set of values. So we're, we're full of maximizations, things we're trying to maximize. Um, we don't know how we develop these things. So, um, the, so what we did, we totally ignored that question, because it's actually very hard to develop an algorithm that um, uh, co-evolves uh, value. Well, fundamentally, I think that we have to develop a cognitive architecture, right? And we don't know what that cognitive architecture is, but I think it's going to be something like you have evolution of policies, you have evolution of models, um, and you have evolution of values. And these, th these three things interact in some way. And that's probably what, what's happening in our brain, but I don't know more than that. So um, this is what we did anyway. So. So this is a sort of example of um, uh, uh, a fairly standard example from evolutionary robotics, but where we're using this, um, uh, this, this architecture that I talked about. So we've got a Neo and a Jolly Jumper. We started off in the morning. Uh, so this has run evolution for about six hours um, over the course of a day. So the, 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 we just randomly initialized population of controllers for the, the robot. And uh, the fitness function we fix. We don't. Um, uh, allow it to evolve that. We try to, uh, but there's a scaling issue because you have a value, you've got to try it out for some time and see how much you're progressing on that value before you can try another value. Um, and then you have to select, so there's a hierarchical selection process. So the evolution of values is an order of magnitude slower than the, the evolution of policies in the framework we had. So that problem needs to be solved. Nobody knows how we co evolve values and things to do. Um, so the behavior of the robot. Uh, so it's in there for about six hours in total. Uh, there's the fitness of the robot over time. Uh, oh, sorry. The fitness function is to maximize the first derivative of the Z accelerometer. So we just fixed that. So it's just trying to maximize bounce. We didn't put the per ounce in. The per ounce bit would have been maximizing the Z accelerometer divided by the motor energy. Um, here it got its foot stuck on the cushion. <laughs> um, so the fitness went down, all those things died that were, and then it had to readapt to the, the foot being stuck on the cushion. Uh, there it's readapted. So it's actually using, it's developed some closed loop controllers, so it's using the force sensitive resistors on its feet to, um, to push off. We, we, did, we, um, we did a test just uh, in a moment to test that. It's called removal of cushion. Um, <laughs> so this behavior is quite changed. It was, it was uh, cushion dependent. <laughs> and so that those uh, uh, units of evolution die off that uh, now we're cushion dependent, and we cushion independent units of evolution are now replicating better. Pushing 
Anyway, so this goes on. And uh, let's just watch this. So it's it's quite trivial. It's it's discovered a resonant frequency of, uh, of the of the baby bouncer. Now, um, what we need to do is to obviously the whole point of the um, uh, algorithm is that we can now store that structure, that representation, and evolve more and more behavior um, that uses the all the kinds of uh, skills that it's learned um, to then. Uh, be able to do more and more skills. We don't quite know how to do that, but that's what's required. The ability to accumulate adaptations over multiple tasks. And that's what nobody's achieved in developmental robotics. That's, there's been you know, millions of pounds worth of investment into uh, robotics. Nobody has solved the problem of how to accumulate adaptation. And that's really where we believe that uh, some kind of ensemble method, that, because this is an ensemble method that um, is evolutionary, um, is required in conjunction with standard machine learning. So. That's um, so we've got we've got to improve that cognitive architecture. So there's several levels of investigation. Another aspect is language, right? So uh, how do we learn language? And as uh, time has gone on, we've moved. People are moving obviously from more of a uh, Chomskyan uh, universal grammar idea where there's no search uh, to something where more search is allowed. So the problem was that search is very difficult, and the best work on this is by Luke Steeles, who's been looking at fluid construction grammar. This is where, basically, constructions are uh, computational units that transform um, uh, meanings into utterances and utterances into meanings. And these constructions are actually inferred during child development. And he's got a very detailed model of this, and it's fundamentally an evolutionary model. There's evolution of these constructions. There's a population of them, and they produce new constructions with variants. And uh, so. We're trying to work out, A, at a computational level, how this thing works and whether uh, evolutionary principles can be included in that. So there's some issues. Thinking in this way is a different perspective. It allows you to ask questions like, do things like Eigen's error <coughs> threshold apply in the brain? And does that explain um, uh, the differences between other species and us? And... Um, uh, all kinds of issues about diversity maintenance and so forth. Uh, so, so we're basically looking at this from different angles. Uh, and so I, I think I'll leave it, leave it there and leave some time for questions. So I have a question, which is how many replicators can I fit in my brain? Is that enough to do any thinking? Mm, mm. Um, I don't know. Uh, we, we, our models are not at that level of uh, predictive ability yet. I think when we start modeling the, the Kilgard's result on auditory cortex, then we will be able to say things like that. Uh, but I can't say yet. Um, one of the, you can have things like elitism, you see. You can, I mean, it's going to be more like an evolutionary algorithm in a sense. It doesn't have to be constrained by exactly the same principles as in genetic evolution. And so I think one of the, but, yeah, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Just that my impression is that evolution is slow and rather inefficient. Ah, right. Thinking is hopefully a little bit more efficient and a little bit faster. Um, well, uh, the that's interesting. So I think that I, I've completely forgot to talk about modeling human cognition. So, for example, um, you could actually look at the time complexity of. Uh, uh, well, the only way to work out, I think, whether an algorithm is being done in the brain or not is to look at how the time it takes to solve a problem scales with the size of that problem. And that's what we're beginning to do. So one of the, uh, this isn't the, so, and these are in tasks called insight tasks. So for example, here's the nine dot problem. You have to join these nine dots by four lines without removing your pen from the paper, right? So there you generate um, ideas and you select ideas. and. Uh, many people can't solve this in, uh, in days. Some people can solve it in half an hour. So there's a distribution of times to solution, right? So we can try and model processes that produce these times to solution um, in insight problems and look at how, the, how that's working. So that's one approach that can be taken.
Could you actually, um, since you're talking about the, the time for things, so if I look at things on a much, much faster, so visual recognition tasks, um, which one can do things which are very high level, incredibly fast. By the time, between the time it gets to the brain and when you've done it, yeah. over 100 milliseconds. And there, there's at least presumably some hierarchy of complexity of visual recognition tasks. But as far as I know, no one has really studied, or at least not systematically, as far as the time that it takes us to do them, or what it might in various models. Okay. And so, those have the advantage that so fast, there's not much time for feedback and various other aspects. Okay. Um, so that, has been, that, has been, that has been studied. So visual search has been studied, and it's quite clear that there's some kind of parallel chunking model that explains uh, most, there's two kinds of search. Um, one way you can do it in parallel, one way you, you need a more serial process. It depends on the discrimination. It's, categorization, it's categorization, not uh, it's, it's like, for example, finding an L in lots of distractor T's. No, that kind of like thing. whether a picture has an animal in it. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. But I don't think that, so that kind of process is not going to be one where, uh, we're not saying that natural selection is required in everything. So I th that's, not a, that's not going to be a process of search. That's going to be a process where you've got um, by natural selection, because you've got all the, it's going to be a process of some kind of competitive learning. You have all the instances there already, you're, uh, and you're assigning, you're, those are competing at a very fast um, uh, scale for belief. That's a different process than what I'm suggesting, which is a stochastic exploration, where you're actually generating novel hypotheses. And but, so, as, but as you're learning what kind of things there are in the world, and how to recognize them, yeah, as you're learning, well, that yes. process might have more, Absolutely. it's that learning how to do the recognition tasks. I agree. I agree, I agree. So, That's my absolutely. So I, I just think I'm clarifying a possible misunderstanding with, with Nick's question and perhaps the previous one is like, I don't, well, are you proposing that uh, an evolutionary process is involved in thinking? Rather, I don't think you are. I think you're saying that an evolutionary process is, is involved in uh, evolving how to think, right? So that the things uh, that you do at uh, runtime yeah. are. So I'm proposing that, for example, um, when you get proposed, well, there's a nice nature paper called Sleep Inspires Insight. So I'm proposing when you, when you have a problem and you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning, that natural selection has been going on in your brain to solve that problem. It's selection between different ways of thinking. It's selection between solutions. Yes. You know, selection. Yeah. So th that's your distinction between the runtime and the selection amongst different ways so of the, running. The thinking is fast. It doesn't require any evolution. Doesn't Deductive thinking doesn't. Uh, I think induction where you have to search in the space of hidden causes uh, required. Because you could, some, some, for example, sometimes yeah, no, no neural network can solve the identity problem. So um, there are some problems where you just can't statistically calculate the solution by observing the data. You actually have to have an idea. Some kind of hidden cause has to be hypothesized, which then tries to make sense of that data. And, and then you've got to search through hidden causes. That's why doing science is hard, because you've got to make up the hidden causes, the hypotheses that might explain stuff. You can't just directly get from what's seen to the hypothesis. So you have to do some search in, Isn't in the hypothesis space. Isn't there some evidence that Nicotine does that? At least as well as sleep, create the long range connections? And... I find it occasionally helps. <laughs> no, no, I think there's studies on it. Ah, oh, yes, I think they, they, got, they gave um, rats and rats. And what's the evidence that it improves? So it improves lateral thinking skills, creates long range connections within the brain. Uh, it's just that addicts can no longer do any lateral thinking without the nicotine. Right. Um, but apparently, if you're a non-addict takes it, you can create all kinds of long-range connections. Mm. Cool. Let's try later. So <laughs> <laughs> another, another general thing, Professor. Um, in, in the more regular framework of evolution, of natural selection, and not just then you have a population of related indicators or producers, or that has some size, and uh, its evolution is affected both by uh, selection and by data in different, with different contributions depending on the population structure and size and so on. Uh, so do you think you have a full analogy for that framework in the brain? Um. I think there are going to be, well, I think the selection functions, the, the criteria upon which uh, a replicator is selected, are going to be very complicated and dependent on which part of the brain it's in. I, I think it's very interesting to look at, uh, well, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to look at copying fidelity and how much information can be um, evolved in the brain. I haven't thought specifically about drift, but that's... Uh, Worth looking at. Sometimes we have random thoughts. 
Sometimes we have, yeah, I mean, yeah. A fellow that I and dreams seem to be recombination between Yeah, so there's been lots of, the, look, this isn't a new idea. I mean, uh, uh, it starts from William James. Everybody's talked metaphorically about it. Lots of people have talked metaphorically about uh, some kind of recombination. So for, we, we, as far as, you know, there are only a few people that are actually trying to look at the, the, the whether it, it could actually mechanistically be implemented. And Actually, since you're being a bit philosophical, um, so I guess there, there's a lot of very inspiring things in, in here um, from the point of view of the neuroscience. And from what I understand, there was a clear motivation for some other ways of thinking about it coming from evolution. But beyond that, once you've got the sort of inspirations and a you know, way of thinking about it, do I care very much whether it's related to evolution in other ways? Um, do you care, I guess? Or, 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 why should I, I care? I, 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 uh, sure. Yeah. Why should you care? Right? Okay, good. Yeah, that's good. So I, I think we, the only reason you should care is if this is the only way to produce um, uh, artificial intelligence. So that's one reason, I suppose. If, if, it's, if this is going to help us to construct a cognitive architecture that can actually produce, uh, that's one reason. The, the other reason is if it's, <laughs> we need to actually produce that model of the auditory cortex to make explicit predictions, if it's actually not possible. And then, if it's possible, then we can use the whole, everything we've learned from evolutionary biology, all that theoretical stuff, we can apply it to neuroscience. That's not an insignificant thing to do. As you, you think there's enough clear understanding of things about evolutionary biology that that will be useful beyond the inspiration? I think neither neuroscience or evolutionary biology has all the answers, but possibly together they might have yeah. more. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much.